So hello, and welcome to today's Texas Science Festival session, The Best Possible Diet with Jamie Davis and Molly Bray. We're so happy that you joined us today. My name is Robin Metcalf, and I'm a lecturer at the School of Human Ecology. So before we get started, a few uh, technical notes. Please note that all participants will be muted and without video for the duration of the webinar. Because this is one of our Science Sparks events, each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes, and then we'll move to questions and answers, Q&A. So please use the Q&A feature by hovering around the bottom of your screen at any time to submit questions you would like our speakers to answer. We also have some pre-submitted questions you provided, and we'll do our best to get through what we can. So now I'd like to introduce our presenters. I'd like to introduce Jamie Davis, Associate Professor of Nutritional Sciences. Jamie's research focuses on designing and disseminating um, nutrition plans, physical activity programs, and behavioral interventions to reduce obesity. Her work focuses on metabolic disorders in overweight minority children and adolescents. So let's hear from Jamie. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. Today, we're going to be talking about the best possible diet. But first, we have to acknowledge that obesity is a problem. We see data um, like this showing that over the past two to four decades, obesity has been on the rise. And approximately 74% of US adults are overweight and 43% are obese. When we think about weight gain or weight loss, it's really about how many calories come in versus how many calories go out. And if you have more calories coming in than you're burning, then weight gain will likely occur. If you look at macronutrients, so our macronutrients are is our protein, carbohydrates, and fat. If you look at the trends over the past four decades, you see that um, the bottom one is protein. Protein intake has stayed pretty consistent. It's between 15 and 18% of our calories come from protein. Whereas um, total fat intake was much higher. And many of you guys may remember that in the 80s, there was that big low fat craze. Um, if you're like me, my father actually would eat an entire box of Snackwell cookies because they were low fat and he thought they were healthy for him. Well, clearly what happens is they decrease the fat in some of those products and increase the sugar or carbohydrates. And fat intake really has stayed consistent really over the past three, four decades at around right around 31%. What we see has increased over time is carbohydrates. And we see that right now, car the average carbohydrate intake is about 55% of the calories come from carbohydrates. But the quality of carbohydrates is of concern. So we know that high quality, um, sorry, low quality carbohydrates, which are your, your refined grains and your added sugars, those are all carbohydrates. Those, are those make up a majority of the carbohydrate percentage. Whereas high quality carbohydrates, which are your fruits and your vegetables and your whole grains, are um, make you know are not as big of a percentage and only can only make up about ten percent of the carbohydrates that we eat. And almost half of Americans consume um, the added sugar comes from sugary drinks, and so forty six percent of our added sugar intake actually comes from sugar sweetened beverages. And on a given day, nearly one in three toddlers, and when I say toddlers, I'm talking about 12 to 23 months, consume sugary drinks, whereas one in two adults consume sugary drinks, and two in three children between two and 19 years of age consume sugary drinks. And sugary drinks, we know that it's linked to adult and childhood obesity, but we also know that it's linked to poor oral health, cavities. We see that it's linked to cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, and liver fat, which leads to liver disease. 
We see that changes in ultra processed foods in the US over the past two decades has also been on the rise. And we would expect to see trends like this in children. Um, we know that children eat a lot of prepackaged foods, but we see similar increases in young adults and over 40 years of age. And we can't ignore the fact that increasing in portion sizes is a huge problem and actually um, contributes to this excess in calories going in. If you look at portion distortion over the past 20 years, this is a bagel 20 years ago. This is a bagel today. It's approximately 210 extra calories. Here's a hamburger. A small hamburger from McDonald's versus one today is approximately 310 calories extra. A small soda and um, today is approximately 180 calories extra. And a pasta dish, approximately 525 calories extra. And many times what happens is we learn this increased portion size from either eating out or prepackaged foods, and then we equate it to what we eat at home. So our portion size across the board has increased. We look at what dietary interventions for adults work. There's a number of ones out there, and the diet industry is a billion dollar industry. Do we cut fat? Do we cut carbohydrates? Is it sugary beverages? Is it sugar? Is it gluten? Is it grains? Every day, I feel like there's a new diet that hits the market. Timing of day when you eat. Um, and so it's really confusing. And I think a lot of us are confused by the messages out there. I wanna spend some time going through the most common types of diets that we know. And there's been a lot of literature over the past two decades that have really highlighted the difference between high protein versus low fat diets and a lot of meta-analysis and high-impact journals. And so this was a paper that came out in 2014 and it was really nicely done. It basically compared low carbohydrate diets. And these are your Atkins, your South Beaches, your Zones. And this is when the diet is under 40% of the calories come from carbs, approximately 30% from protein. And it's definitely higher in fat between 30 and 55%. And they compared it to moderate macronutrients, which is like your biggest loser, Jenny Kreb, Weight Watchers. And this is approximately 55 to 60% calories from fat, approximately 15 from protein and less than 30 from fat between 20 and 30. Versus low fat diets, which are approximately 60% of the calories come from carbohydrates, approximately 10 to 15% from, from protein and less than 20% from fat. And when you look at the comparisons of low fat versus low carb on weight loss, it's pretty astonishing that, and these are you know, multiple clinical trials that have done this, and they've looked at both weight loss at six months and 12 months. And essentially what they find is actually no significant differences in weight loss between a low fat and a low carb diets at both the six month and a 12 month time, time period. However, a lot of studies, uh, meta-analysis have looked at the differences between these two diets on metabolic outcomes. Low fat diets typically lead to a reduction in total cholesterol and um, LDL cholesterol compared to low carbohydrates, whereas low carbohydrates lead to an increase in HDL and a reduction in the total cholesterol to HDL ratio and a big reduction in triglycerides. There was actually no difference in systolic blood pressure or in glucose, um, glucose control between the two diets. But when you look at um, the mechanisms behind this, we do see that low carbohydrates um, or high protein diets versus low fat do result in increased adherence. The adherence is better to these diets and low carbohydrate diets have been shown to improve in satiety. So you're less hungry. Uh, low carbohydrate diets compared to low fat diets have also led to less lean body mass loss, so less muscle loss, loss. And these have been a number of studies that have shown these. And here's just a, um, you know, a figure that shows you all the different studies that have been done really over the past two decades, comparing all the different types of diets from Atkins, low glycemia, Mediterranean, Ornish, Paleo, Zone diets. And if you draw a line kind of down the middle, the long-term weight change is very similar across these different diets. This is a recent study that was, that was done by a colleague, Kevin Hall, and he actually was curious, okay, if we keep the macronutrients the same and we just alter whether the food is ultra-processed um, versus unprocessed, so just a real food, uh, what happens. And what we see is kind of astonishing. This was a 14-day inpatient trial with just 20 adults. So it was a small feasibility trial. 
and they fed the, the participants meals that were matched on calories, fat, sugar, sodium, fiber, and all the macronutrients. And the meals were provided, but they did let them snack outside of the meals. And what they found is that the unprocessed diet resulted in about 500 calories less a day of just eating additional snacks. And it also le led to significant weight loss compared to the ultra processed diet at two weeks. So that shows real promise that maybe there's something to just going back to eating whole foods. I have to plug my own research. I actually uh, do a lot of garden-based work with, um, with kids and with families. And uh, you can read more about my study at texasprouts.org. Um, but we like to test the effects of getting kids back to eating real food. And so it's a gardening, it's a one-year gardening nutrition and cooking program. And we do test the effects on obesity and metabolic outcomes in third through fifth graders and their families. And we are just wrapping up this study and we had a lot of really interesting findings. With over 3,000 children, um, we saw that the Texas Sprouts um, schools versus the control had increases in vegetable intake. They also had increases, increases in the ability to concentrate. They had increases in physical activity levels improved glucose control, they had reductions in lipids, and they also had increases in academic performance. So while weight did not change, obesity levels did not change, we saw a lot of really key points come out, a lot of key findings uh, come out from getting kids back to eating real food. So take home messages is that actually all diets can be effective for weight loss. If your energy in is less or your energy out is more, it will re result in weight loss. But an effective diet is really one that you can stick to forever. We know that yo-yo dieting can actually decrease your metabolism in the long term. So if you choose a diet and it's not something you can stick to, it's probably going to be worse off in the long run. So really my you know, key take home message is that you really should choose a diet that you can sustain and thrive on and that you're not always hungry and something that you can do forever. And also I have to make a, make a big plug for a suggestion to eat less processed foods. The literature is pretty clear that processed foods leads to a whole um, uh, slew of, un, of metabolic diseases and obesity. So I really encourage people to get back to eating real foods. And when I say whole foods, these are foods that don't have a lot of ingredients in it. And I always try to tell our kids and our families to choose products that have, if you can get it less than five ingredients, that's great. But if you can get it less than 10, that's also good. Try to get less ingredients in your food and that ensures that you're eating a whole food. And then um, I can't get by without saying also to limit added sugar and sugary drinks. If you are drinking a coffee beverage loaded in sugar every day, if you cut that out, you'd be surprised that cutting out one sugary beverage a day has a significant reduction in your overall calories. Thank you. And now I'll take some questions. So that was great. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, super interesting. So let's see, what do we have here for questions? We have about 10 minutes. So, um, so here's a question um, for you, Jamie. Would you comment on the poor adherence and high drop dropout rate with high protein, low carb Atkins diets and so forth? High dropout up to about 40% in Ad, uh, Atkins type diet? Yeah, I, I think that that's kind of what I'm saying is I think that some people choose to go on a protein, high protein diet, and it's not a good diet for them. They can't stick to it. Whereas, um, you know, the, the ranges, depending on what study you look at, can be any between, you know, a 20 to 40% dropout rate in the high protein diets. Um, I do think that people, you know, even though, so if you can stick to a high protein diet and it's something that works for you, then it could be a good diet for you. Now, I'm a big proponent of not the super high protein diets. I like, I think that if you can get, if you can still have fruits and vegetables and whole grains, I think that's a nice balance to a high protein diet. Whereas somebody might be on a low fat diet and they're able to adhere to that better. And so in that respect, I think that diet would be the one that would work for them. Great, um, here's another one. So does UT try to implement the conclusions of his research in the menus of on-campus dining? Like for example, smaller portions, particularly of high cholesterol foods and more choices of whole foods? 
Yes. I mean, I know that the food service has worked really hard to improve um, the nutrient content of foods and they've made a big push to actually post the calories, which is now a requirement and made a big push to also decrease in portion sizes. However, um, dining usually offers a variety. You can get, you can still get French fries, but you have the option of getting, um, you know, different types of vegetables and whole foods as well. I know that there's a big push. There's also a big push to actually uh, work with more local farmers and to supply more um, local produce to the cafeterias. And I think that that's really, um, in my opinion, that's the direction that the, that UT Food Service should be going. Yeah. Um, okay, so here's another question. Um, I know people who have controlled their diabetes with keto and with low vegan and low fat. How can this be? Well, again, I think that um, those types of diets, so keto, keto diets, um, I think most of the diets out there don't actually put yourself in ketosis. Um, there's very little uh, data on ketosis diets for normal adults. There's actually a lot of data to suggest that um, uh, high, you know, uh, ketosis uh, diets are good for epilep epileptic patients. Um, as far as like the normal patient, I think that we should not try to put your body in ketosis. I have a type one son and I spend half my life trying to keep him out of ketosis. So um, I am not a favor of putting your body in ketosis. However, if you eat less carbohydrates, your body typically will break down some fat for energy. Um, I just, I think there's a balance between a little bit of fat to break down and a lot of fat breakdown that your body needs and actually putting yourself in ketosis has a lot of negative health um, uh, consequences. Okay, well, here's a pretty simple question. Um, so is 1% milk good for us or oat milk or silk milk or all these things, milks? <laughs> Well, uh, dairy is, is good for us. It's a good source of protein. It's a good source of calcium and vitamin D. Um, a lot of people don't realize if they switch to a different type of meal, milk early on, they'll actually develop an allergy to regular milk. And so that's not uncommon for somebody to give up dairy for a little bit and then try to eat dairy again and then have upset stomachs um, because they've actually developed a, a little bit of a lactose intolerance to that. And so switching to an oat milk or soy milk has the same amount of protein. Many times it also has the same amount of vitamin D and calcium. So it's a great substitute. Um, I would be cautious though about if you do give up all dairy products, if you go completely vegan, then you should probably definitely take a calcium supplement because um, it, it is hard to, if you're not using dairy, it is hard to get enough calcium from just uh, fruits and vegetables. Right. I'm also noticing there's uh, quite a few questions that are, that are all about uh, vegan diets and in one aspect or another. I mean, there's, there's one here about um, a vegan diet where the person has experienced a significant drop in cholesterol. Um, there's one person who um, just, I think, wants to know whether or not a vegan diet is healthy, is a healthy option. So I think I there's- think a vegan diet is absolutely healthy. I think one thing you have to be careful is that you're getting enough iron. That's our biggest concern with somebody that goes totally vegan, but um, you, know, you can eat a mixture of whole grains and and uh, uh, legumes, and you can get the iron you need a lot of times if you have a balanced diet, um, even without protein. Um, but I do typically, if I have vegan patients, I do recommend that they are at least on a multivitamin and iron supplement. But yeah, eating a vegan diet can be completely healthy. It can help lower your cholesterol. It can help you lose weight. Um, and again, if you can stick to a vegan diet, and that's something that you can do for a lifestyle change, and that, that, that's a perfectly acceptable and healthy diet. Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of questions that have to do with like, is this diet healthy? Is that diet healthy? Is this good for me? And, and they, they fall into sort of groupings like, is a high fat diet uh, healthy? Is a keto diet healthy? I mean, maybe you want to yeah, comment on right? what's healthy, you know, in general, because you'll get a lot of these different categories. Right. I think a high fat diet, I would say a high protein diet um, is, is which has obviously if you're having high protein, typically that is high fat. Um, I'm not a proponent of going out and eating a bunch of bacon and fried foods and 
um, to me, you know, even though, uh, you know, we do know that um, high protein diets have resulted in reductions in lipids, but many of those high protein diets have actually pushed lean protein sources. And so your saturated fat content isn't super high. So I think that there's enough evidence out there that high diet, diets high in saturated fat is, can be bad for you. Um, so I think you can still eat a higher or high protein diet without getting your saturated fat content super high, choosing lean meats, um, many fishes, uh, you know, lean, uh, poultries. Yeah, and I'll just speak to the fact that, you know, there's some diets that actually have you, you know, uh, pee on a stick to make sure you're in ketosis. I think that those diets are dangerous. Um, I think that, you know, the body's it's, it's okay to actually burn some fat, but having fat be the primary source of energy for your brain, um, is, is, is dangerous. And we do know that actually on those ketosis diets, uh, you, you do lose a lot of, uh, muscle mass as well. And so I think that that's, you know, I think a, a high protein diet can work, but I'm not a proponent of a, um, of a ketotic diet, unless you're an epileptic and there is pretty solid evidence that that can decrease seizures. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe one more question or two. Um, so here's a question about basically, you know, how, what influences to, um, about the ideas what we have around diet. So for example, how damaging are diet trends on social media and how can people distinguish what is helpful and truthful with an overabundance of fitness and nutrition tips online? There's so much coming at us right now. Right. And um, does the new trend of tailoring food and exercise based on body type truly work? Okay. So let me answer the first question. I think that, I think that, you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there and I try to highlight the, what is evidence-based and what we know, but every day there's a new diet that hits the market <laughs> and it's not evidence-based. And I always laugh because of the books and the whatever will claim that it's evidence-based, but it has no clinical trials have been done. Um, so I think I would be cautious for any of those type of studies that there's not hard evidence to support its effectiveness. If it was written by a celebrity and she lost weight and a couple of her celebrity friends lost weight, I don't know that I would buy that. Um, I think the most important thing is that if it's something that you can do and it becomes a lifestyle change, not something you have to put yourself on, like I'm only going to eat this because many times when we deprive ourselves, that's all we want is that thing we can't have. And so I think that all foods can fit into a diet, right? It's just about moderation and trying to choose a diet that you can stick to for long term. I get have a lot of friends that do, um, you know, buy a lot of the products. So they buy these great snacks, and there's many different programs that you buy the products and you eat it, and that's what they need to help them because they have really trouble making a hard time making their own, you know, making their own foods. And it's just easy if it's just open the package and that's what you eat. And and there's nothing wrong with those types of diets. However, they are expensive and can you can doing that, continue to do that for the rest of your life? I think that's the challenge. Um, you know, so I have a lot of friends and a lot of patients that I'm like, if that's working for you, great. If it helps you lose 20 pounds, but I do see that they, they tend to gain the weight back as soon as they start eating real food again. And so that's kind of why I always go back to, I would try to do it with real food and try to make changes with you know, that fit into your daily life. And it's something that you can do forever. That's great. Thank you so much, Jamie. We actually are out of time. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. So our next speaker is Molly Bray, Professor of Nutritional Sciences and the Department Chair of Nutritional Sciences. So Molly, your turn. Thank you, Robin. And thanks to all of you for coming today. Um, Good questions in the, in, the, in the question chat, so we can talk a little bit more about that maybe too. Um, let's see. So I'm going to start my talk today with a statement that uh, I'm sure everyone will agree with, and that is that weight loss is really easy, right? Um, as Dr. Davis said, uh, whether you focus on carbs or fat or protein, as long as you reduce calories below uh, in calorie intake below what you expend, then you should lose weight, right? And of course, I'm being facetious because for those of us who struggle with our weight, um, we know that weight loss isn't easy. 
And what's really hard is actually uh, weight maintenance, right? So again, whether you focus on carbs or fat or protein, what the data show is that, uh, or even physical activity, what the data show is that uh, weight loss is, followed, is generally followed by weight regain. There was a large ongoing study uh, called the Look Ahead Study that was an exercise, it was a um, weight loss intervention in type two diabetics. And they recently reported uh, their eight year follow-up data. And what they said was that the Look Ahead's intensive lifestyle intervention produced clinically meaningful weight loss of 5% or more at year eight in about 50% of their, patient, of their subjects. And uh, what the media picked up was the very negative message that 50% of the subjects in this study experienced no significant weight loss at eight years. And one particularly inflammatory website actually went so far as to say obesity research confirms that long-term weight loss is almost impossible. So these are the data from the study here in these graphs on the right. And actually what I see is a lot of promise. So as a geneticist, I, I'm looking for variation and what you see is a lot of variation. And although you do see individuals regaining weight following the study, um, most of the individuals at year eight weighed less than when they started. And you also see that there are some individuals that not only maintained weight loss, but continued to lose weight. And these are, this is the type of response that we're actually really interested in determining how to personalize diets to maximize the, the optimal response. And response can be defined in many different ways, but we recognize that people don't respond to the same diets the same way. So Francis Collins, the director of the National Institutes of Health actually said, the nutrition affects people differently. We're still in the beginning stages of understanding how nutrition can improve health and prevent disease. And in the 2015-2020 dietary guidelines, the word personal actually appears 24 times, acknowledging that while we create guidelines that are, uh, that are good for the general population, we know that some people respond differently to those diets, dietary recommendations. So in personalizing diets, we can, we can look to the genome. Uh, nutrigenetics refers to taking the variable parts of the genome and examining which of those parts actually seem to influence response to diet. So in this case, there's a variable place in the genome. And keep in mind that there are 6 billion bases in the human genome, and about 400 million of them are variable. In this case, this C to a T variant is associated with increased weight gain given the same meal for these individuals who have 2T forms of this particular variant. So we can continue that, that idea and explore the entire human genome. And we can combine that with other kinds of omics measures with the idea of not differentiating people necessarily by racial ethnic groups, but by differentiating them by response versus non-response. So I'm going to describe a study that, that kind of is a perfect example of all of these concepts. Uh, Aaron Segal's group in, in Israel in, enrolled a thousand individuals in this study and they measured them for a whole host of phenotypes and, and, and other kinds of measures. They characterized their gut bi microbiome, they measured a host of, of blood markers, they asked them questions about their lifestyle, their medical history, and their habitual food intake, as well as characterizing their body size in many different ways. Um, they asked them to monitor and record everything they ate on a, on a mobile app. And what their real goal was, was to normalize gl blood glucose, so your blood sugar, with the goal that, that maintaining a normal blood sugar would result in a down, downstream um, positive effects. So to test the, the individual's particular response to different kinds of carbohydrates, they gave them seven days of standardized breakfast meals. Um, they gave them two days of just plain white bread, two days of bread with butter, uh, two days of a drink containing glucose, and one day of a drink containing fructose um, with the idea that they could characterize uh, the, these, these responses to, carb, to a carbohydrate load. And then they were, the, the intention of the study was to take the data that they collected, do some computational analysis, and create predicted diets, diets that were predicted to maintain blood glucose or cause blood glucose imbalances. 
So their data actually show uh, really nicely how variable the response to diet is. So the classical response to a carbohydrate load is for glucose to rise and then insulin to, to follow. And as insulin goes up, then glucose starts to come down and both of them normalize after some time period. What uh, Zevian et al. showed was that there is a wide range of variability to the same exact kind of meal. So in this case, they're talk, this, this graph is looking at white bread and showing that these four individuals actually see highly reproducible responses. So within subjects, the responses are very, very uh, stable, but highly variable responses to the same exact uh, dietary uh, intake. Here's another example of that same kind of variability. On the left are people who would give it, were given glucose and bread. And you see these two different individuals on the top and the bottom responded completely uh, opposite to this glucose, very easily metabolized bread, a more complex carbohydrate. And you see this very off opposite response. On the right are two individuals um, eating bananas and cookies. Bananas containing lots of fruit sugar, cookies containing lots of it's table sugar, uh, sucrose, and yet you see these completely opposite responses. So as I mentioned, their goal was to, to use these data to predict diets that would maintain blood glucose. So they're monitoring blood glucose continuously throughout the study and characterizing people who are stable versus not, uh, and, and relating that to what they're eating during this time. So they predicted diets that would that would produce both stable and unstable glucose and then tested them in the remaining part of the cohort. And they actually have some really amazing results where they show that the diet, the green diets predicted to be good diets actually do appear, at least in these two individuals, which they show, um, appear to stabilize blood glucose and the bad diets, the diets they predicted would produce instability in glucose le levels absolutely did, did that. The reason why, why often people focus on maintaining blood glucose is because it's actually the insulin that follows a glucose spike that um, is associated with increased uh, accumulation of body fat. So pretty cool and amazing data that actually later has, has more recently been shown that this was an Israeli cohort, and it, this has more recently been shown to also be effective in predicting diets in an American cohort. So um, can you get a personalized diet? Well, yes, you can. There are any number of companies on the market right now uh, perfectly willing to take your money and give you a personalized gene-based diet. And for the most part, these companies are not selling you anything of value. Um, the reason why is because they take reported literature and uh, findings that were, that were made in populations of people and interpreting them as if they were uh, individualized pre prescriptions. And I'm gonna give you two examples actually from my own, uh, from my own genetic tests, which I had this done so that my class would have some, some data to work with. So this is health claim number one. Molly, you are likely to weigh more on a diet high in saturated fat. Um, it's giving me a little bit of information about me, but it's based on one variant in the entire genome. It's based on one paper and one gene in which they showed that this particular variant in the APOA2 gene was associated with a mean increase of 6.2% BMI in individuals with the CC genotype who ate this particular diet. And the population being studied in this case is Puerto Ricans. So not only are they giving me population-based information as if it was personal, but they're not even giving me population-based data from my own population. So um, very much an inter misinterpretation of the, of the literature. Here's one more example, uh, a gene-based health claim. Molly, based on your genetics, you are likely to drink slightly more caffeine if you drink caffeine at all. So a little caveat there. And this is based on two variants in the genome and one paper in which uh, uh, several variants were identified for coffee and coffee drinkers in a very, very large population of Europeans and African-Americans um, in which they said that if you have this risk raising allele, you're likely to drink 0.03 to 0.14 cups more per day. 
So the effect is pretty mild. And again, a misinterpretation of population-based data uh, at the level of an individual. So the other thing that people don't realize about these gene-based diet tests is that they have the ability to identify things like non-paternity. So there was a case in which a mother, a father, and a daughter all wanted to get their gene-based diet so that they could lose weight together. And uh, based on the genotypes that you don't need a whole lot of genotypes to identify uh, non-paternity and based on the genotypes in their, in their diet report, uh, it turned out dad wasn't dad. So that's probably not information they wanted to get from their gene-based diet. Um, the test can reveal confidential information about other family members with enough members of your family genotype, you can infer genotypes to other members of your family. And of course, as we just talked about, tests can be misinterpreted or overinterpreted. So how do you personalize your diet right now? While you're before you, what you're not part of a research study, but what can you do to personalize your own diet? Given that right now, our general recommendations are to eat a healthy diet. And as Dr. Davis said, a healthy diet can be, uh, can take many forms and to exercise. And I would say, pay attention to how you respond to different foods. So recognizing that not everyone responds to every food in the same way. So you might buy the book, uh, there's the carnivore diet. This, the guy who's a big proponent of the carnivore diet says everyone should eat meat and nothing but meat and that's the way to go. And clearly there will be people who he, while he seems to thrive on that diet, there will be many people for physiological as well as personal reasons would not be able to, to eat the meat diet. So as you're eating foods, pay attention to your mood. People don't realize that certain kinds of food, foods can affect their mood state. Pay attention to your energy level, pay attention to your weight gain or weight loss associated with foods that you eat. And you can be your own study of one um, <clears throat> until you can get your, your personalized prescription. I would also say that if you're not exercising, try to incorporate some exercise into your life. And there are many, many uh, versions of this seven minute workout. And for lots of us who are sitting in front of our computers uh, or screens of many kinds, uh, just getting up for seven minutes, almost all of us have an extra seven minutes in the day, can actually do a lot to to actually promote, uh, not by itself, but to promote your weight loss efforts and your weight maintenance efforts, and also to promote your mental outlook. So um, if you don't think that this kind of personalization based on genetics and other kinds of omics is possible, I will tell you that it absolutely is. When I was in grad school a million years ago, this was our sequencing technology where we literally separated nucleotides one at a time and read with a ruler down a sequencing gel sequence. Um, and you can imagine how long that would have taken. The sequencers of today, some of them are small enough to fit in your hand, which means that sequencer uh, can actually be in a clinic. It can be in a, in a health setting uh, where people can actually collect these data and input them, create these algorithms and apply them to you. So that's coming and probably not in the distant future. I would say most of the companies on the market don't, are not doing this kind of comprehensive data collection, but that kind of, of capability is absolutely in our future. So I would say don't believe the current hype of the gene-based diet programs. The fancy packaging and the slick reports, they look beautiful, but they're giving you pretty much uh, absolutely either misinformation or no information of value. Personalizing your diet is the future of precision nutrition. And there are many, many very cool, innovative projects underway. And precision nutrition is actually the, the, the big, big focus right now of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive Diseases. Uh, there is an ongoing study and some of you might know about it. It's called the All of Us Study. And it actually, the goal is to enroll a million people and to characterize them from birth to death for a whole host of measures with the idea that, that all of the exciting uh, computer algorithms that are being developed right now are going to be able to create these, uh, these predictive algorithms that can optimize diet to your you. you. Uh, and uh, so it is our future. Don't, don't, uh, don't be 
uh, doubtful, it is absolutely going to happen. Thank you so much for watching today, and I'll take some questions. Thank you, Molly. That was super interesting, especially right around lunchtime, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> this is all timed right around our lunch times. Um, so you anticipated um, a lot of the questions that came up around this whole uh, genetic testing uh, option about uh, determining diets. And so, but I think you covered that really well, you know, talking through the pluses and minuses, a lot of the minuses, and also providing some alternatives to that as well. But there is a, quite a bit of interest in the audience from that. Um, and here's another question that's sort of tangential to that. Um, what are your thoughts on the blood type diet and its validity in relation to the gene-based diets mentioned? Are you familiar with the blood type diet? So the blood type diet is probably the, the oldest sort of gene-based mm. diet. And there's, there's not really much um, bio, biology uh, underlying the, the blood, blood type diet um, with the exception that blood type can be a marker for other things. So blood type can be a marker for your racial ethnic background. Blood type can be a, marshal, a marker for your environmental um, surroundings as well. So uh, in terms of the biology, it's not very well supported biologically, but um, uh, it's not it's not a diet I would go run out and, and follow. So there's also interest in um, you know what goes on in our gut, you know, basically like gut flora. In fact, I think there are some companies that are actually looking um, at that and and mapping that um, individually as well. So in in these studies that you cited, was there any effort made to control for the gut flora? Well, actually, that's a really good question. Uh, in the study that I walked you guys through, um, the microbiome, my, microbial composition and changes in microbial composition were, were some of the strongest predictors of, of whether or not the, the patients would be able to, the subjects in the study would be able to maintain glucose. So in that study, the microbiome data was actually incorporated into the predictive algorithm. So not really looking at to see how the microbiome changed uh, so much as looking to see how the microbiome predicted uh, future change. And it was one of the strongest predictors. So yes, absolutely. Um, microbiome informs how we might respond to a given diet. And then in turn, the microbiome feeds back and contributes to that response as well. So I think the microbiome is, is um, such an important part of our response to nutrition that, that incorporating those data, which is actually, again, pretty easy to do, uh, is gonna be a big part of personalizing nutrition in the future. So you mentioned a little bit in your um, presentation about, in fact, I think it was to your particular genetic um, mapping the, about uh, drinking caffeine. Um, and this individual would like um, her question is, or his question is, is coffee okay, like two to three cups a day, or should this person drink tea um, because this person likes caffeine? <laughs> well, uh, okay, so I, sh I should probably leave the, the specific uh, dietary recommendations mm -hmm. to, the, to the RDs. But again, people are variably responsive to, to caffeine. And some people um, have, see, see, see significant changes in things like catecholamines and, and excitability with caffeine. And, and caffeine, uh, but, but for example, in sports, caffeine can be a really, um, a really great ergogenic aid that, that is allowed. And caffeine can help with uh, minimizing fat deposition. So there's good things about caffeine. I think I would go back to the, uh, uh, unless you're super sensitive to caffeine, everything in moderation. So not overdoing something like caffeine, um, you know, but these kinds of tests would, would actually be good if they were valid to tell you about whether, about sensitivity. But your own paying attention to your response um, is, is, the, is the most important data that you can get. You know, I think uh, you did a great job on talking about sort of the mindful eating, you know, being aware of your moods, sensing how you respond to food, which is an um, excellent recommendation. I'm going to have, we have one more, t one more question, time for one more question, and it's going to circle right back again to genetic testing because there is so much interest 
in it from our um, attendees today. So here it is. How, um, how will we know when the genetic-based diets have moved more into evidence-based territory? That's a, and that's a super good question. And actually, Aaron Segal's work, which I showed to you today, um, they are developing a co company. I don't want to plug any companies, so I don't want to make it look like I'm, I'm developing a company. But um, that's a really good question. And it, it's also a question of how well these, these particular kinds of businesses are regulated. Um, because clearly right now, just saying that you can do it is enough. Um, to, to be able to start your business. Um, so uh, I, I would say that, that probably the newer businesses, the, the newer kinds of companies that are based in more, more deeply in research should emphasize that as they, you know, as they put out their, their dietary recommendations. I think all the companies make it sound like they know what they're doing. Um, but uh, I agree that uh, that will be one of the harder things to, to differentiate is what is a legit kind of recommendation versus what is a, a hokey one, especially for people who aren't scientists or don't, you know, don't read the literature all the time. So that will be that will be key. Well, thank you, Molly. It's been very, very interesting and be uh, interesting to hear comments um, some time out now on some of these developments. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us today for our Texas Science Festival talk on the best possible diet. And I'd like to thank Jamie Davis and Molly Bray for their time, their knowledge and their expertise. So please be sure to visit sciencefest.utexas.edu to sign up for more sessions between now and March 26. And contact cnsdev at austin utexas.edu if you have some follow-up from today's questions. Thank you so much for your interest in Texas science and we hope to see you virtually at more sessions. Thank you. <laughs>